I want you to open your Bibles to Psalms, the 78th chapter, if you would. Psalms, the 78th chapter. We're going to be beginning there this morning. I want to talk this morning. I titled this message, Living and Leaving a Spiritual Legacy, because that really is our calling as fathers. And I'm here to just specifically speak with you all today and those that are joining us online. We thank you for doing so. So fatherhood has always been in the heart of God. I mean, the moment that he breathed into Adam's nostrils, the breath of life, God stepped into his role as a father. And he, he loves his children. Say, say this out loud, God loves me. God loves and that's something, uh, you know, something you, you were taught when you were a little, little child. And, uh, and he really does. He loves us in spite of our imperfections and our human frailty. And he, just, he doesn't love us conditionally. He loves us unconditionally. And I'm so grateful for that. Hallelujah. So what kind of father is God? Well, he, his, his attributes are, uh, are listed in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22. And let me tell you what he is. He's a loving, kind, good, gentle, joyful, merciful, gracious, patient, faithful, affectionate, and forgiving father. Why don't you give him a good shout of praise? That's what he is to us on a daily basis. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible, that, in the book of Hebrews, we should never uh, leave that out. And it talks about the chastening of the Lord. Uh, the Bible says that God chastens those he loves. He doesn't chase, chasten us with adversity, uh, car accidents and storms. He just simply chases us with conviction. Amen. How many understand the convicting power of God's spirit? It never, ever feels good. But boy, when you yield to it, hallelujah, you are able to be released from the things that are uh, attacking you and walking in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just for some of you who are here visiting today, <clears throat> you heard this woman speaking uh, language. Uh, the Bible talks about that. Uh, in, the, in the Bible. Uh, it's called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But what she was sharing there was actually uh, not the experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. People get that confused. They think it's all one of the same, and it's not. So she spoke out. There's two gifts. So there's nine gifts of the Spirit. Uh, the gift of the word of wisdom, the gift of the worldly, uh, word of knowledge, and the gift of discernment. And then there's the gifts of healing, the work of miracles, and the gift of faith. And then the, the last three are Tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. And so it doesn't benefit the church if someone's speaking in tongues and there's no interpretation. So she spoke out in tongues by faith. Uh, she was moved by the Holy Ghost. And then there was a, uh, there was an, uh, a word uh, uh, in English to interpret what the Holy Spirit was saying at that moment. And just to help underst you understand so you don't um, uh, you know, misunderstand. Uh, you understand what the Bible says. We want to obey the word of God, obey the counsel of God. So I just want you to know that. So in Psalms 78, uh, oh, anyway, so the moment that God breathed into Adam's nostrils, the breath of life, he literally breathed into his nostrils the attributes of God. So on the inside, we have the attributes of God. And how do they increase in your life? How do they increase, or how, how does the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, how, how does it increase in your life? It increases through something called the law of seed time and harvest. See, if you're waiting for somebody to love you before you love them, you have it backwards. Because God loved you before you loved him. Can I have an amen? I'm glad for that. Hallelujah. So if you want the blessings of the Lord, or if you want the personality of God coming out of your life, then you have to sow the, that fruit from your life towards others, even when it's inconvenient or they don't even deserve it, you still do it. Amen. Amen. Anyway, in Psalms 78, God was addressing the fathers of Israel, the spiritual fathers of Israel, okay? And he's given them a, a, spiritual, a, a spiritual assignment. And here, verse 1 of Psalm 78 uh, verse few word, the, the first few words are, give ear, O my people, to my law. And I believe that, and you'll see it as we go on, that, that law he's referring to is the law of love. In fact, James calls that law the royal law. If, it, if indeed you really fulfill the royal law of love, uh, the royal law in accordance with the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself, you do well. So he's referencing the love, the law of love, or, the, or we can say the Ten Commandments, which, of course, are whittled down to two. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, right? And your neighbor as yourself. Everybody say amen to that? Amen. That's, that's what it is. So let's go on. 
Give ear, O my people, Psalm 78, verse 1, uh, 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 to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. In other words, I'm going to reveal to you things that have been hidden, but now that, that, that I want to open my heart to you, just to let you know that I want you, as, a, as, the, as God's people, I've chosen you uh, to love you and to bless you and to allow you to be the nation that is a light to all the other nations around you. You have to understand, see, in the Old Testament, nobody was born again. But God, because of the faith, and we'll talk about it in a moment, because of the faith of Abraham, God raised up a, a people called the Jews or the Israelites, and God wanted them to carry the message of God's love to the world around them. The world around them, just like it is today, was dark and, and, um, and was uh, sinful, uh, evil, uh, perverted, um, uh, filled with idolatry. And so God wanted them to be completely separated from these nations and so that God could bless them and so that their blessing would become a light to the nations around them. If you agree with me, say amen to that. And that really was their calling, okay? And um, let's continue. He said, which, uh, I will open my mouth in parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, in other words, somebody before them had gotten this message or carried this message or continued to carry this message, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing, that word showing literally means recounting so as to celebrate, uh, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. So as you continue, and we're not going to read all of it, we don't have time, but if you continue in Psalm 7, 8, you'll see that he's, he's recounting the great miracles that God performed for Israel when he brought them out of Egyptian slavery. Egypt is a type of the world uh, from the hand, the clasp of a Pharaoh who is a type of the devil, and he did it through the, anointed, uh, the anointing upon a man by the name of Moses who is a type of Christ. Amen. Raise your hand if you've been delivered from some, some great things since you've been saved. Delivered, because God wants you delivered. And guess what? Once you're delivered, you got to be careful and make the right choices. They don't you retreat back into bondage again. And because it's easy to do with the world uh, that is around you uh, to influence you. So let's watch this. Verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, uh, th these great acts of God, even the children which should be born, who shall rise, should rise up and declare them to their children. And, 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 and that they, now if you study this out uh, chronologically, you'll see that he's going to the first, second, and third, and fourth generations. Uh, God wanted four generations. I have Right now, uh, I have my children. I have, uh, we have our children, our grandchildren, and uh, I'd hopefully we'll live long enough to see some grandchildren. Great. I mean, great grandchildren. And then, <laughs> amen. And, but I'm not sure if we'll see the great greats. But my point is, hopefully that the faith and the love that we had throughout our lives will be imparted to our children so that they have an anchor in their lives when it comes to the adversities of life. They won't be moved away from God. Can I have an amen? Thank you, Lord. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, uh, but keep. That word means guard, protect, maintain, and obey his commandments. Now, there it is, his commandments, which is, he suggests he's literally pointing to the Ten Commandments so that they were to learn and obey, okay? So this morning, again, I want to talk about le living and leaving a spiritual legacy, which I believe is the calling of every Christian father in the world, and especially here today. So what is a legacy? It, well, it is something that is passed on or handed down to the next generation. It could be, of one, for us, it would be like our faith, uh, our faith in God, our love for God, our allegiance to God. Can I have an amen? That's what we want to pass down to, uh, to the next generation. And it, it isn't just by words that we pass them down, but it's our lifestyle. It's how we live on a daily basis. And that's why you have to be so careful. I hear this so often amongst Christians that they're talking about just how bad the days we're living in. We're just living in bad days. Uh, I mean, we just don't have any hope. Well, if we don't have any hope, our kids don't have any hope, and our grandkids don't have any hope. Amen. 
So no matter how bad it gets, we got to p- deposit faith in their hearts so that no matter what comes, they're, they're true to God no matter what. And if they're true to God, God's going to take care of every one of his kids. Come on, give God a good shot of praise if you believe it. You have to be so careful not to be pro- being the propagator of evil. There's evil all around us. You can talk about it 24 hours a day, or you can talk about the goodness of God, the delivering power of God, the healing power of God, the goodness of God, the provision of God, the protection of God. You can talk about that all day long. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm learning too. Praise the Lord. A legacy comes from one's character, reputation, and the life that they led so that they could set in motion an example for others to follow to help guide their lives as well. I want my children to know they can trust in God. Uh, Amen. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, verse 5, it says, They that trust in the arm of the flesh uh, shall live under the curse, but those that trust in the arm of God, their lives will be blessed and flourishing. And that's what we want in our lives. God was expecting the spiritual fathers of Israel to preserve and to rehearse all they'd witnessed when God brought them out of Egypt, from the plagues of judgment upon the idols that they worship to the dividing of the waters of the Red Sea, which really was symbolic of Israel's baptism into a new and blessed life. Amen. That's exactly what that was. You can, you can, in fact, you can confirm that in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, if you want to know about that. Amen. So why did God want this? Verse 4, to show uh, to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. Amen. So God is looking for 21st century Christian men, godly men, faith-filled men who will carry the message of hope to the world around them. And what grieves my heart and what, what and I've cried out to God about this. The book of Acts talks about how God gave the church the early. Think about this. The early church didn't have, the early church didn't have the letters from Paul yet. But they had such a trans, such a transformation of their lives. They had such a, and all it was, they, all it was, they just preached Christ. Amen. Amen. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ. The love of God, forgiveness. Amen. But they preach it with such conviction that lives are being changed. And we live in a world today, and I'm not sure what it's going to take to awaken the church to the fact that you have a testimony that someone around you needs. You do. You do. I do. So God's looking for these men who are both full of the love of God Hallelujah, and full of the wisdom of God and full of the unwavering faith of God. Now, in Hebrews 11th chapter, we're just going to look at a couple guys that maybe we'd like to follow, that we'd like to uh, mimic in our lives as believers. Now, we know Hebrews 11 is filled, it's called the Hall of Faith because God recorded for our benefit just a few men and women who were full of faith. And because they were, they did, great, they did great things for God. Or I should say, God did great things through them. Hallelujah. Amen. And um, we, uh, let me just say this. I wrote this down, and the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, God already knows your flaws. He's not focused on your flaws. He's looking for your faith. I just want you to know that because, see, if you just focus on your flaws, you will never be able to hear the spirit that's saying, I want you to share with that person. I want you to share with that person. I want you to let that person know that your life has been changed because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The reason we're not seeing conversions is because God doesn't have the laborers necessary. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I just want to, to, to stir you up because you do have the answer for the people that are plagued by the devil, by the evils of this world. Can I have an amen? So praise the Lord. What or who would you like to follow after as, as, uh, as a believer in the 21st century? Well, there, I, I was just going to take the first couple, even not probably the uh, first one, of course, would have been um, Abel. Uh, but then there's a man by the name of Noah. And the Bible says in his day, think about this. Now, I don't know how many people, I Googled it, but they didn't know. <laughs> how many people were on the earth? <laughs> to Google be the glory, great things. No, anyway, we don't know how many people were on the earth at that time. 
but he was the only righteous man. One believer. You talk about labor shortage. Out of all of the creation at that time, there was one believer. His name was Noah. The Bible says that he was a righteous man. Hallelujah. And we could follow his, what I call his faith and his patience. In that what? He sacrificed. He lived a self-sacrificial life to build an ark, the Bible says, to the saving of his household. Uh, He had been warned by God that there was going to be a flood. And it had never rained at that time from the heavens, according to what I've heard, that the earth was, was um, watered by the dew or the moisture from uh, underneath. And so for him to believe God, to believe such a far-fetched tale, uh, he did. And because he did, he saved his family. And I like what it says here. Uh, but not only his family, he preserved the families that followed. And here's what it says. We'll read it. Prompted by faith, Noah being forewarned by God concerning events of which as yet there was no visible sign, took heed, diligently and reverently constructed and prepared an ark for the deliverance of his own family. By this, by this, his faith which relied on God, he passed judgment and sentence on the world's unbelief and became an heir and possessor of righteousness, that relation of being right in, into which God puts the person who has faith. So God's called all of us as fathers to build an ark for the saving of our families, an ark of humility, an ark of subservience, an ark of faith, an ark of obedience, amen, an ark of unconditional love, an ark of the wisdom of God's spirit. I did not have a good childhood. I'm not going to get into it. I'm just simply saying I did not have, in fact, I, uh, uh, I, I was uh, bound by hell itself. But the beautiful thing about it is that when God saved me and set me free, I was able and somewhat to, to, to impart to our children and hopefully now our grandchildren, praise God, there's a God who loves us. He's faithful. Hallelujah. He forgives us. When we fall, he picks us back up. He is a good God. Can I have an amen? And I want them to know that. Why? Because they're going to experience uh, things in their life where they're going to have to depend on God. Now, we know that in the times we live in, just like every generation, we're not diff- any different from generations before us. Every generation deals with the, the flood tides of adversity, heartache, loss, setbacks. We, uh, every generation does. But we, God, if you remember this, he built an ark, hallelujah. It's called the Holy Ghost inside of us. He built an ark for us to rest in him no matter what we're going through. And uh, both, I mean, both, uh, every one of you have been through hard times along with us. Uh, I wish it would have been uh, recorded that when you step into ministry, you're free from all heartache and pain. (laughs) But that's not true. We all deal with the same issues, but we all serve the same mighty God. Hallelujah. Can I have an amen? We sure do. So I believe, again, this is the second one uh, that you would like to follow is a man by the name of Abraham. The Bible really tagged him. Just think for 5,000 years, uh, he's, been, he's become the father of faith or an example of the faith of God that, or the faith that you can have in God. Can I have an amen? We know that for years, he, he, he spent 25 years believing God for this promise that God gave him. And the Bible said, read it out of, if you read the Hebrews, the sixth chapter, uh, verse 13 on down to the end of the chapter, out of the message translation, it really is inspiring to know that God was there all along leading Abraham, praise God, until, that, until he reaped the fulfillment of what God promised. I believe sometimes, we'll, we'll, I'm not sure what's going to happen. We, get to heaven, we all get to heaven, we all assume things. But uh, I believe there are many times that we're, just, we're halfway to our victory and we give up. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We're just about ready to receive the miracle and we, and we just uh, stop believing God. Or we start to murmur and complain. And we retreat, right? we, we retreat in our faith in God. And I, don't, I want to see victory for all of us. Can I have an amen for whatever you're dealing with in life? Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. 
So the Bible says in Hebrews, uh, the 11th chapter, um, it says that urged on by faith, Abraham, when he was called, he obeyed. When he was called, he obeyed. Amen. Hallelujah. And went forth to a place which he was destined to receive as an inheritance. And he went. Now watch this. this who was it? Well, who was the great uh, man who went to Israel uh, many, many years ago, 100 years ago? And he said it was the worst plight he'd ever been in, the worst desert. Just the, Mark huh? Mark Twain. Yeah, Mark Twain. Thank you. I mean, just, I mean, just uh, I, who would ever want to live in this puke place? Who would ever? I mean, it stunk like sewer. And I mean, every, there was nothing good about the place at all, except when the Jews came home in 1948, hallelujah, and God began to bless it for his glory and honor. Amen. I said amen. So God made a promise. Here, let's go on. So he obeyed. He went, although he did not know or troubled in his mind where, where he was to go. Prompted by faith, Abraham dwelt as a temporary residence. I want you to catch this. In the land which was designated in the promise of God, though he was like a stranger in a strange country, watch this, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs with him of the same promise. And I'll stop there for a moment. Think about this. He was the wealthiest man in the world at that time. Could have stopped, could have put down his roots, could have built a mansion, but he literally was so detached from the temporal and so had his, had, had his faith focus on the eternal that I tell you, he just stayed faithful to God until he entered into heaven. Isn't that beautiful? That's what he, he, was, he was obsessed today. Uh, maybe, maybe this, I don't know. I never, I always believe God for the best, but uh, I wonder what's going to uh, shake the church to get out of its love for the world and get into God and God alone. You know, we go to the Philippines. We've been there ministering other countries, but we, we have a couple of churches that we support. And so um, we go there and, and uh, uh, they, I mean, for the very poor countries, uh, you know, Guatemala too, and poor countries, they don't have anything. The poorest in our country have it better than the poorest in those countries. And, and, and yet those people that love God, hallelujah, they love him for who he is, not for what they have. They're just grateful if they have some rice in a plate and, and some chicken to eat. Kind of have an amen on that. You know, we're so overly blessed that we should be proclaiming the goodness of God outside these doors. Amen. So I hope that the Holy Ghost begins to serve something these last days because we have a job to do before the king comes. Can I have an amen? Let's finish this. Prompted, well, okay. Well, watch this, last verse 10. For he, Abraham, was waiting expectantly and confidently, looking forward to the city which has fixed and firm foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So he was completely focused on the eternal, not the temporal. Could have been distracted, but he didn't. He loved God so much that he didn't want to do anything to detach himself from his commitment to the Lord. Hallelujah. 1 John 5, 4 says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Now, how does faith come? Watch this. Romans 10, 17. This is the King James. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But listen to this translation from the contemporary English version, CEV. It says, no one can have faith without hearing the message of Christ. Isn't that good? See, when you mention that name, I'm telling you, not only do the demons trouble, but it touches the heart of the individual you're ministering to. I love that. It says that no one can have faith without hearing the message of Christ. And what is this message? It's a message of God's loving kindness and tender mercies. A message of faith for today and hope for tomorrow. A message of righteousness, peace, and joy, both inwardly and outwardly. Amen. Not good? A message that I'm hoping that I have somewhat carried in my life for my children and my grandchildren. As Christian fathers, we're called to exemplify Listen, a life of unwavering faith in God. Uh, exemplify the person and personality of Christ, which includes a, a life of subservience and self-sacrifice. I get so grieved in my heart that when I hear about divorce, because I really believe I, I, if we men would take the leadership of subservience and self-sacrifice, we would destroy the works of the devil in every part of our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. So that 
the generations to come would carry on the message of God's love and salvation because that's what I'm believing for. I get grieved in my heart, kids, when I hear of our young people, other churches, young people, Holy Ghost, born again, spirit-filled kids, leave, leave church or graduate from high school and they leave God there at the church. It grieves my heart because that's not what it's supposed to be. They're the ones who keep carrying that message unless the message has been so distorted and blurred by the compromises of our lives as parents. Especially us fathers. Tom Landry, former coach of the Dallas Cowboys, said this, my greatest leadership role is not on the football field, but in my home. He understood that winning on the football field, yet losing his home was not an option. There's a, oh, this is Proverbs, this is good. Proverbs 22, 6, as you're all familiar with the King James, says, train up a child in the way that he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. The Passion Bible says, dedicate your children to God and point them, point them. You do that through your lifestyle. I get sad in my heart when I come to church. I'm just, I encourage you. I get sad in my heart when I come to church and the guys, uh, you get two or three women to come forth and the guys just sit there like a bump on a log. Well, guess what your children will become? They're going to become a bump on the log because the fathers are the ones that take the spiritual leadership of the home. <clears throat> I'm telling you this. When I come to church, I'm just like you. When I come to church, a lot of times we're carrying the weight of certain things. But when I come, I devote and dedicate my time of praise and worship to the Lord who deserves everything that I have. Can I have an amen? Amen. <clears throat> we have to exemplify our passion and love for God. But it's not on Sunday. On Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Amen. I mean, that's, that, that is what our aim should be. Yes, we all get frustrated. Yes, we all just, sometimes life is really hard, but God graces us for what he's called us to do. He really does. Thank you, Lord. There's a difference between teaching and training. Teaching is verbal instruction, but training is about life life application. Amen? God has already equipped us as fathers for the task that he's called us to do and be, and that is a light to the world, especially to our family. And finally, to leave a legacy, we must live who we love. And to do this, we have to carry out those two commandments. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and your neighbor as yourself. That is our calling. But it begins in the home. It begins amongst our relationships as husband and wives and amongst our children. In Luke, the 10th chapter, I'm winding this down. In Luke, the 10th chapter, says, Then a certain lawyer arose, watch this, to test, to try and test and tempt Jesus, saying, A teacher, what am I to do to inherit everlasting life? That is to partake of eternal salvation in the Messiah's kingdom. This is the Amplified. And Jesus said to them, Well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this. There's the challenge. Do this. Do this. And the Bible says, you will live or leave a legacy of your presence to the next generation, that's what he's saying. Do this, and you will leave a legacy for your children to follow. Quite a responsibility. But whatever God requires, he empowers. Can I have an amen? That's why even these times of services are important. They're simply opportunities for us to corporately receive what God wants for us at this moment in our lives. Amen. Amen. Very important. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 
5, 1. Listen, this is a beautiful scripture. Oh, let me read Psalms 127.4. I, I want to read this. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. What does that even mean? He, he's saying, this, uh, uh, the psalmist was saying that children are like arrows, and you are the archer. And man, men, this is so true. Men, you will be pointing them in the direction that they need to go. That's why our commitment and consecration to God is so important. It's so important. We cannot afford to compromise. We cannot afford to compromise our moral convictions. We can't afford to just uh, throw away our love because we don't feel. Love is not a feeling. Love is a fruit. You have to keep sowing it no matter what. I mean, you, I bet there's more time, probably 80% of the time you have to love by faith. Especially in the marriage union. Can I have an Amen. You're loving by faith. Why? Because there's warfare all around you. But God's love never fails. Hallelujah. <laughs> never fails. It only fails when we stop exercising it. Thank you, Lord. Listen to this. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, one, verse 1. This is the message translation. Uh, I think it was Angie that many years ago said, Dad, you got to read the message Bible translation. Watch what God does and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Come on, give him praise. So keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. So love like that. Man, that's beautiful. That is just beautiful. Thank you, Lord. You love us like that. It's the very reason God chose Abraham. Listen to this, Genesis 18. God said, I know him. I know him. God knows you. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. I know him. I can use him. I can flow through him. I know him. Here's the... Here's the uh, um, message translation. Yes, I've settled on him as the one to train his children and future family to observe God's way of life, live kindly and generously and fairly so that God can complete in Abraham what he promised him. So to leave a legacy, kids, you're going to have to uh, live who we love. And I do. I love the Lord with all my heart. There's not day, every day I'm, I'm talking to him. Every day I'm communicating with him. Every day I, I'm, he, he, um, Especially at our age. You know, uh, my, both my parents died from, from the loss of memory. And, um, and when you get older, you go, oh, I, for, I forgot about that. I forgot. So I rely on the Holy Ghost because God said in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, that we have the mind of Christ. Well, who, what's the mind of Christ? The Holy Ghost. So every day, even yesterday, half a dozen times, he, he's telling me, oh, yeah, th sir, thank you. Thank you for reminding me of that. I really appreciate that. Oh, and then all of a sudden, I got thought of something. Oh, thank you. I thank you. I, man, I know I didn't think about it. Hallelujah. He gave it to me. Amen. I'm not talking about spiritual things. I'm looking for a hammer. Oh, thank you, sir. I remember I put it there four months ago. <laughs> Vicky always tells me, if you put it where it belongs, you'll know where it's at. I'm still trying to get a hold of that. <laughs> she goes in my garage and I don't even want her to go out there. Yeah, she wants to organize everything. Everything. Amen. She organizes my underwear drawer. <laughs> she, everything's got to be organized. That's her ministry. It's not mine. <laughs> I'll get in trouble if I keep going. <laughs> Diedrich Baumhofer was one of very few German ministers who courageously stood against, confronted and condemned Hitler's murderous acts against the Jews. He, knowing, listen, knowing it would most, most likely cost him his life, which it did, of course. This is what he said. The righteous man lives for the next generation. And that has really been the desire of my heart as a man of God. 
is that my children will have something spiritual to hang on to when I'm gone. That they will say, wow, I sure miss dad because he would, he would, he would show me this scripture. He would teach me this by precept and example. I, would lo- I hope that happens. Amen. Of course, my wife wants the same thing. That our children and grandchildren saw the God likeness in our lives. And I know you do too. Can I have an amen? Amen. This is good. As fathers, we are the first Bible our children will read. You and I will leave within our children what we live out at home. Our children are not looking for perfection, just spiritual consistency. Hmm. Especially when it comes to how good and faithful God is. I think sometimes our children get stressed because they think that they have to, you know, they have to live this certain perfected life, you know, because they're the preacher's kids. I don't think about this, but that they're the preacher's kids, you know. And so it adds extra pressure to their lives. Because we've all heard about PKs, preacher's kids. But I'm proud of this preacher's kids, all three of them, all proud of their I'm not finished. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm proud of their mates that they married. I'm, I'm so proud that they carry on the message of love and faith in God. Very, very grateful. Prideful, no, but proud. Very, very grateful. Because there's a lot of preachers, kids that aren't serving God today. But praise God, mine are and ours are. And we're so grateful. How about you? Are you grateful? Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Walter Skura, I'm not sure how you spell his last name, uh, senior, he was one of the original seven astronauts back in 1959, uh, chosen to fly in the Project Mercury um, ship. Uh, 1950, I didn't realize it was that far uh, back, 59. And here's what he says. You don't raise heroes, you raise sons. And if you treat them like sons, they will turn out to be heroes, even if it's just in your own eyes. Not that good? And then Theodore Hesburgh, he was a, the former president of the University of Notre Dame. He said this, the most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mom. It is the key to your children's internal security. You love their mom. You respect their mom. You bless their mom. You stand beside their mom. Can I have an amen? It will literally bring internal security into their lives so that they don't have to suffer the consequences of our bad choices. Amen. Bow your heads, musicians, you can come up. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray for the fathers, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer myself. Praise the Lord. I want you to know how much the Lord loves us, loves you as a father. He wants you to do, be- he wants you to do better as a father. Amen. Amen. I mean, when I was younger... My greatest fear would be to not have my children serving God. To have them go astray. I, I met, uh, Vicky knows this, uh, we met a preacher whose uh, son, there was a couple of them, one had a daughter, one had a son, born again, spirit-filled young man and woman who went to college and completely aborted from anything that they were raised to believe. Completely left everything. You got to be, man, if you're going to send your kids to college, you better send them to the right ones because there's some crazy loonies out there uh, of professors that are just corrupt. And they're, um, yeah, and they're ready to, they want to seduce your children. Uh, They're led by the devil to end up mocking the very things that are precious in God's sight. That's their love and devotion to him. So you really have to really be smart. But I'm going to pray for the fathers today. Bow your head if you would just for a moment. The first thing, it's impossible to be a a reflection. Listen to me now. It's impossible to be a reflection of God's character if God's character isn't in you. So I'm just addressing anyone here today that might not have Christ in the center of your life. 
Now, and now, just close your eyes for a moment. Just think about this. I'm not, and I know sometimes, you know, we have this thing about, okay, what is a Christian? Well, a Christian is one who literally exemplifies God's presence in their lives. It isn't someone who just simply prayed a prayer, but nothing about his life reveals that God's presence is in him. So this is important. Jesus called it, you must be born again or born of the Holy Spirit. On the inside, you are a spirit being. On the outside, you look like your mom and dad, physical. On the inside, you're made in the image of God. But Adam lost that divine connection with God when he transgressed. So Jesus is called the last Adam who came back, who came into our earth to give back to us what the first Adam lost, and that's eternal life. But to have eternal life, you need to surrender your life to Christ. Or maybe you're here and you say, well, I prayed that prayer, but there's nothing in my life uh, that reveals Christ. Uh, that, you know, that, that, that it, it, uh, the old saying, if you were arrested today for being a Christian, would there be any evidence to convict you? So I want to pray for you first. So if I'm talking to you, you want to surrender your life to Christ today because you know it's the only way you're going to have life, an abundant life, just quickly lift your hand. I'll pray for you. Anybody? You say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to surrender my life to Christ. Be nothing greater than you receive into your life your heavenly father. And maybe you didn't have a good father. But don't allow that distortion. For you. Don't allow that to keep you from knowing your heavenly father. Because he is a very loving father. In fact, the Bible says he is a father to the fatherless. Is that cool? He's a father to the fatherless. Amen. He is. I want all the fathers to stand this morning. Isaac. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Would you just lift up both hands to heaven? I want to pray for you today. Gracious Father, I thank you for these men. I declare what you, what you said to Gideon. I declare that they're mighty men of valor, mighty men of faith, mighty men of love, mighty men of God. I call them that, Father. And God, thank you that you, you are the one who makes us what we need to be. So, Father, I ask you to bless these men with a greater measure of your presence. I ask you to open up the eyes of their understanding so that they really can understand the depth, the height, the, the width, and the length of your love, that they will know it. Not only know it, but they will exercise it on a daily basis, especially towards their families. Father, thank you for blessing them with your presence, with your power, with your provision. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, I want everyone, just keep your eyes closed and head bowed. And I want everyone, all the fathers to pray this out loud. Heavenly Father, I'm asking you today to help me become the Christ-like man you've called me to be. Please help me to make the required adjustments within my heart, my attitude, my character, and my words. So that my life will become a reflection of your love and presence. Please help me in my role as the spiritual leader of my family. So that I become everything my family needs me to be. A man of righteousness, godliness, and holiness. A man who loves you and proves it with a life of faith and self-sacrifice so that when my earthly life ends, I will have left a legacy for my children and my grandchildren. Heavenly Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Lift your hands one more time. Give him praise. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for watching the message. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart, and Jesus, 
I make you Lord of my life, and I thank you for saving me. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Make sure you get into a Bible-based church like Faith Family. Open your Bible and read it daily, starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Surround yourself with godly friends that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. We trust that you are encouraged, strengthened, and are ready to fight the good fight of faith. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share this message so we can reach more people to fulfill our mission of strengthening families through God's word. Let us know in the comments below if you gave your life to Jesus or how this message touched your life. We would love to hear from you. God wants you to know that he is for you, not against you. We love you. We are praying for you and your family. We'll see you next time.